Welcome everybody to the Keto Edge Summit, where we are dispelling the myths, helping you overcome the hurdles, and empowering you to improve your brain and your body and get an edge in life through the ketogenic lifestyle. Today's topic is diabetes and the ketogenic diet. It's a controversial topic because a lot of people with diabetes are concerned about ketones. So I brought in a great friend of mine and a world-renowned expert in diabetes. This is Dr. Brian Mole. And Dr. Mole is the founder and medical director of Sweet Life Diabetes Health Centers and serves clients worldwide as the diabetes coach. He's a master licensed diabetes educator and was one of the first doctors to be certified to practice functional medicine by the prestigious Institute for Functional Medicine. We've had a lot of guests that have been certified through them, so Dr. Mole is one of the first. Since 1998, Dr. Mole has been helping people across North America to optimize their health and metabolism, control blood sugar, and reverse type 2 diabetes using a natural, personalized lifestyle approach. He's the man when it comes to diabetes, and we're going to dive into this topic deep. Dr. Mole, so great to have you on. Um, I know you're going to provide tremendous content for our audience today. Well, thanks, Doc. It's uh, it's great to be here, and I always love talking to you. I uh, always have. Uh, we have some great conversations, and this is a really important topic, so excited to dive in. Yeah, absolutely. Huge. And so tell us your story. I mean, you've been doing this for a while, and obviously you have this specialty in diabetes. What really got you going? Why did you become a doctor to begin with, and why did you choose to specialize in diabetes? Yeah, I think there was always a, an interest in health and fitness for me. You know, I kind of came up through fitness, athletic training, uh, exercise physiology, and then I uh, knew that I wanted to do more. I didn't want to be a researcher per se, and I wanted to work with people. So uh, through school, um, you know, I uh, kind of decided that I wanted to take it to the next level. I uh, got into practice and similar to you, I think, uh, realized that I wanted to incorporate nutrition and and other lifestyle factors uh, into, you know, a holistic care model and started doing that and had a great time with it. I did a lot of workshops on all sorts of topics yeah. with my patients but uh, just really gravitated towards diabetes. I think for me, it was an area that uh, we saw a lot of success with early on. Uh, had some people come in with diabetes and just started researching it and, and working with them and had some success and then realized that they were so frustrated. You know, just these first few people that I dealt with, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, and then as I started to look around, I realized, wow, this is a major area of really ineptitude in medicine. You know, there's, there's the mainstream conventional approach to diabetes is so far away from what we do in natural healthcare and functional medicine. And I really thought that the two could be blended in some way. You know, I think conventional management is still good. It's still important. Uh, but it leaves a lot still on the table that isn't being addressed. And I found that the patients were dying for this, literally dying for this information. Yeah. Um, that coupled with the fact that it's become an absolute uh, menace to our uh, society and our culture, not only here in the US, but around the globe, that there really needs to be a solution. And I felt like there, there really is a solution People just don't know about it. You know, people just aren't being taught and, and practicing it. So to me, it was just that fire, you know, to spread that message to as yeah. many people as we possibly could. So I started doing that in my practice. Uh, it wasn't long before I realized the limitations of, of teaching people one-on-one -on -one in an, you know, in a closed office with me and their family. Uh, and then started uh, trying to branch out, uh, you know, once the internet boom happened then I, I sort of gravitated towards that and, and started uh, teaching online as much as I could. And uh, eventually my practice kind of transformed to be uh, global, which is, has been pretty awesome. So I think it was a, it was a combination of you know, that personal uh, passion for health and desire to reach and help more people you know, with, uh, with what I, I believe really is, is knowledge and information that can save lives that, uh, people just weren't learning through their conventional medical system. 
Yeah, for sure. And I mean, we look at diabetes in general, we've got a huge rise in pre-diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and type 2 diabetes. And so what do you think the reason, I mean, can you, can you kind of define those three conditions? Because there's a lot of confusion on what each one of those is, how somebody develops it. And uh, what are some of the sure. major causative factors and why we have this huge rise in, the, in these conditions? Yeah, you know, diabetes has been described in uh, texts and literature for thousands of years, but really um, with more recent uh, diagnosis ability, I think we're catching more and it's also blown up, unfortunately. So it's, it's two things. Most of the early cases of diabetes described were probably type one. You know, we didn't have, they didn't have that terminology at the time, but we're probably type one. It was, you know, major amounts of sugar coming through the urine. In fact, sometimes they would even taste the urine to, to diagnose diabetes at the time. Um, so most likely those were cases of type one, it was considered like a wasting disease. So these people were losing weight. And, uh, in fact, they thought that, you know, the flesh was sort of turning into urine. Um, and those were kind of the ways it was originally described, but a fairly rare disease, uh, you know, considering all the other things that people were dying with infectious disease and so forth. So, uh, it was really, you know, at the turn of the last century in the early 1900s that we saw cases start to grow. And again, some of that may be related to uh, better uh, diagnosis. Uh, but really, throughout this last century, uh, diabetes has absolutely exploded. And, you know, I think a lot of it has to do, I call it the, the perfect storm for metabolic disaster. You know, it's, it's, it's the diet changes that happened, particularly in the, uh, in the seventies when, you know, we kind of changed from what people were normally eating to a more highly processed diet, high in sugar, we cut out fat and sort of went to this, uh, bread and grain, uh, diet that is recommended still by the American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, which is just tragic, I think. Uh, cutting again, cutting out fat and and more and more packaged foods, more and more processed foods, more fake foods, and then uh, coupled with high stress, and it's not just mental emotional stress, although that is a, a big issue. Uh, we also look at physiological stressors like gut issues and hormone imbalance and toxins from uh, the plastics and uh, environmental pollutants and pesticides and uh, cosmetics, phthalates, and so forth, all of this stuff. These are endocrine disruptors which block uh, proper hormone function. So all those stressors, uh, sleep is become a big issue. Uh, a lot of people are not sleeping properly, which adds more stress to the system. And then we've become more sedentary. You know, it's uh, even people who exercise, you know, they'll sit at their desk all day long and then they'll go out and get an hour of exercise and then they'll come back and they'll sit on the couch and watch TV and go to sleep. So it's, it's not, we're not active like we used to be. We're not out, you know, picking and growing our own food or chasing down and hunting and so forth. So I think all of these factors, you know, it's not just the diet, although that's a big part of it, but all of these factors create this perfect storm for metabolic disease. And that's diabetes. It's uh, many forms of cancer, uh, heart and cardiovascular disease, and even things like brain disease, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we think about <clears throat> neuroinflammatory conditions, which are also on the rise, like Alzheimer's disease, for example, and they're calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes, so a whole new classification. So type 1 is, you know, we, we know that that's autoimmune-based. Type 2, there's more research coming out about how that can be autoimmune. Um, but, you know, it's typically adult onset, and you know, um, you, you know, you've been saying, hey, now we're seeing it in younger and younger people. Yeah, and certainly then, inflammatory. There's certainly yeah. an inflammatory connection. Right. There's an inflammatory con uh, connection there. And then now they're saying type 3 diabetes is kind of this diabetes or insulin resistance in the brain. Can you explain more about that? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's interesting. And, and this is an emerging field of study. Uh, there was a doctor by the name of Susan uh, D. Lamond who did some uh, original description of Alzheimer's, dementia, and it's not just Alzheimer's, actually, it's, it's uh, 
various forms of dementia. Lewin body dementia, for example, has also been associated with diabetes and, and insulin yeah. resistance and high blood sugar. So uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease is, is obviously the most common form of uh, adult dementia. But um, there's, a, there's a connection there somehow with blood sugar and insulin signaling, uh, metabolic uh, disease or metabolic dysfunction. There are many cases that have been described where there's insulin resistance, but uh, not even high blood sugar and uh, Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And so uh, many people think that this is even more related to insulin potentially than it is to just the sugar effect. Although there was a, a, a um, study published uh, just last week, recently here, that showed, it was an NIH study that showed that uh, people with Alzheimer's and dementia uh, have a problem processing glucose in their brain cells. So here's another connection. Uh, with high blood sugar, hyperglycemia, and dementia. So one thing we know for sure is there's a very strong correlation. Yeah. So uh, a high percentage of people with diabetes will develop dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and a very high percentage of people with Alzheimer's disease have high blood sugar and or insulin resistance, like 80%. So it's, uh, there's a very, very strong correlation there. And I think we're still learning about maybe some of the mechanisms of how that happens. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, when, that, when they're not able to really produce cellular energy in their brain through glucose or through sugar <clears throat> because of this insulin resistance, then those brain cells are literally starving because they're not able to convert into basically using an alternative fuel like ketones. That's right. So, uh, yeah. So they, they're not producing enough energy. So there's more oxidative stress and they start to become, you know, damaged and destroyed. And the blood brain barrier opens up too, right? It, it just, that's uh, right. yeah, it opens up because it's starving. The brain cells are starving. So now you get more toxins that may be in the body. Like I know uh, aluminum is associated with Alzheimer's. And so mm -hmm. you start to see that and kind of this whole vicious cycle. And um, so yeah, really, you get the uh, leaky brain syndrome, yeah. kind of like we talk about leaky gut. You get right. leaky brain where you, you get uh, hyperpermeability of the of the uh, blood brain barrier, which exactly. uh, that's a disaster. You know, I mean, you're you're really asking for major issues there. Absolutely, and you know, it's kind of this new concept too. Uh, you know, the 21st century that cutting edge doctors like yourself, you're looking at the gut, you're looking at environmental toxins when it comes to diabetes, when, you know, most conventional doctors are just thinking, hey, do, you know, a low glycemic diet, um, which is important, but they're really not, uh, not, not looking at all the other factors like gut health, environmental toxins, sleep quality and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, I think these barrier systems are really important. You know, there's yeah. three main barrier systems. We have our skin. Uh, then the the gut lining and the blood brain barrier those are really our three main walls if you will right. uh, to protect um, important areas and uh, inflammation uh, destroys them you know it, it uh, chronic systemic inflammation tears those walls apart and that in turn leads to I think much of the disease that we're seeing today so you know a lot of people understand that, these are somehow connected to inflammation, but maybe not exactly how. And I think that's one of the main uh, mechanisms is that uh, that uh, inflammatory process, there's collateral damage, and some of that damage is uh, breaking down these barriers. And when those barriers get broken down, you know, now it's like, uh, you know, the walls are coming down to, to the fortress and, and uh, the enemies are, are getting through, you know, so, uh, and that, uh, can happen in the brain, you know, and, and we see all sorts of brain issues. It can happen in the gut, which then gets into our systemic blood flow and can lead to problems anywhere, uh, particularly vascular issues. And then, uh, you know, the skin oftentimes. And the skin's yeah. interesting because uh, you can use the skin as a diagnostic tool. You know, when you see uh, inflammatory issues, rashes and uh, uh, pigment, uh, pigmentation problems and uh, just a lackluster appearance of the skin, you know that uh, those other barrier systems are probably damaged as well. Oh yeah, totally. Absolutely. 
And so ultimately, you know, when we're looking at lifestyle, we know sugar plays a huge role with all of this sugar and starches and whatnot. And so most people in our, you know, westernized countries, we're addicted to sugar and starch. And so mm-hmm. what are some of the strategies that you use with people that are coming in to see you um, to help basically break those addictions and start transitioning their diet? Yeah, I think that's really important. And in the diabetes community, we see this all the time. So uh, we're, uh, uh, November is Diabetes Awareness Month and um, Diabetes Day was recently. And uh, I'm reminded of this every year because the uh, these diabetes organizations, for whatever reason, they love to put pictures of people with cupcakes and cake and cookies up on Diabetes uh, Awareness Day. And for some reason, they want to make people aware that diabetes is not caused by eating too much sugar. You know, that's like their main push. They're, they're very into like, they don't want to guilt people, which I, I understand. But I think it's, a, un, unfortunately, it's not really a very good message because uh, I don't think those things are good for anybody. And particularly if you can't process glucose properly. Um, so I think the mindset is the most important thing. And, and I like to get that really clear with people. If somebody is has celiac disease and they're gluten intolerant, how much gluten should they be eating? Really none, right? I mean, preferably as little as possible, as little as they can get away with. Mm-hmm. So another name for diabetes or even pre-diabetes is glucose intolerance. That's what it's called medically. In fact, we diagnose it with something called a glucose tolerance test. So if you don't do well in that, you're intolerant to glucose. So if you're glucose intolerant, how much glucose should you be eating? And again, the answer for me is as little as possible. You know, you really don't, if you don't process it well, it becomes a toxin to your body. So why do we want to purposely go out and eat these things? It's like uh, taking somebody who, you know, is a recovering alcoholic and saying, Hey, it's national, uh, you know, alcoholic recovery day. And you get a picture of somebody, you know, drinking a beer saying, you know, great cheers. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. So, um, I think that the mindset is important. You have to realize number one, that those foods, unfortunately for you at this point, if you've been diagnosed with prediabetes or you have high blood sugar, even really if it's in your family, uh, those foods are largely toxic, so we, we need to avoid them as much as possible. The interesting thing about glucose is the liver can make glucose out of fat and amino acids, so we really don't need to consume it at all, um, although uh, there's no evidence that small amounts of glucose you know, are um, you know, are, are, are really all that damaging. I mean, it, it, you can, uh, you can argue where that line is and that, that becomes, I think, very individualized, mm-hmm. but, you know, small amounts of glucose are probably fine for most people, but we want to limit it as much as possible, right. you know, and, and that's, uh, so that's, the, it's the mindset and realize that you don't need it and you can certainly do without it. So I think that's an important starting point. And also realizing that it is addictive. As you mentioned, uh, sugar is highly addictive. You know, it acts on uh, the uh, addiction centers of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, it's called, uh, to um, stimulate the pleasure reward system, you know. So when we eat sugar, we feel good in the short term. You know, we get sort of that that, uh, quick high. Uh, But then when we come off of that high, it creates uh, in the brain and in the metabolic system, a cascade of uh, negative reactions, you know, a negative domino effect. So our brain, uh, you know, once that reward button isn't being tapped anymore, we want to go tap it again. So we want more sugar or uh, carbohydrates or uh, God forbid something else, you know, where we we get addicted to, to something else. And in the um, metabolism, the physiology of the body, we get uh, this blood sugar roller coaster, you know, where we eat uh, sugar and uh, we get an insulin surge. Uh, Most people become insulin resistant very quickly. And uh, 
their blood sugar drops or eventually stays high and they can't uh, utilize that sugar. So they crave more and want more. And it, it just becomes this never ending cycle. Most people are aware of this. If you eat a breakfast with a lot of carbohydrates and or sugar, a glass of orange juice and a donut, or make it a little healthier, a bowl of oatmeal, um, you know, and, uh, you know, let's say some fresh squeezed uh, juice, you're going to feel hungry typically an hour after that meal. Um, and you're going to typically feel rotten. Your energy is going to plummet. You're going to feel awful. And this is what's, you know, this is the prescribed diet for people with diabetes. I had a, a patient of mine, a client of mine, take a picture of his hospital meal. He went into the hospital for an unrelated issue. And, you know, it's marked that he's a diabetic on his chart. And uh, he showed a picture of his meal. I, I kind of added up the carbohydrates in his meal. It was like 70 to 80 grams of carbohydrates wow. in one on one plate, you know? And then of course they inject him with insulin. He's on insulin the entire time he's in the hospital, even though he wasn't on insulin. And that's how they manage diabetes. It's, it's absolutely insane. So, you know, the first thing is realizing that sugar is not necessary and it's not, and it's very addictive. And if you have blood sugar problems, high blood sugar, uh, diabetes in the family, uh, obesity, uh, metabolic issues, low thyroid function, any of these things, you really don't want to uh, be consuming uh, sugar. You know, really, we want to move away from that as much as possible. So I think those are, those are a couple of things to think about, but I think it all starts with mindset. You know, people get this idea that um, they're depriving themselves if they don't eat the, uh, you know, the, the tradi traditional ice cream or or those sweets or those cookies and the holidays, you know, uh, they, they don't indulge in these things. And, and I think uh, we really need to make a, a mental shift away from those things. Yeah, I mean, totally. And, and the reality is that people start to realize, I mean, they say the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who can't read and write. All of us can read and write in westernized countries today and today's day and age, but there are those who can't learn something, realize it's not serving them, choose to unlearn it, like mm. realize, hey, I'm not going to follow that anymore. And then relearn new strategies are going to help them. And so many of us have been conditioned. I know you and I, I'm sure, like I know I grew up, it was Cheerios or oatmeal in the morning with uh, banana and with orange juice. And so all of that just spiked my blood sugar for lunch. It was peanut butter and jelly sandwich and it was pretzels because we were health conscious. So we didn't go with Frito-Lays, we went with pretzels, which are right. all high carb. And then for dinner, it was usually like pasta and vegetables, spaghetti, stuff like that, um, which is all super high carb. And so my blood sugar was all over the place. And you know, another big myth too is that people, um, people think that in a sense, only overweight people get diabetes. Hmm. And in my family, my grandfather had diabetes and he was really, really thin. Right? He was lean. And I know for myself, I'm real sensitive to sugar and insulin. And um, so if I overconsume, I definitely would develop diabetes. And you know, kind of like what you were talking about as well with, um, with sugar cravings, for me, for like today's day and age, I think I've, I've evolved, my taste buds have evolved now, but it, it really took a, many years of conditioning because as I was kind of going through this journey, if I did indulge in something that was higher in carbs or sugar, like the whole next day I was craving sugar. It would literally mm -hmm. take me two or three days to stop having the sugar cravings. Today, now it's like I feel so bad because I've been doing this so long. When I do eat it later that day or the next day, I feel so bad that, um, and, I, and I understand like cause and effect, that the, the pain associated with how I feel That's right. associated with those foods. And, um, and so I don't, I don't, I no longer have the craving because I just don't want to feel bad like that. Yeah. There's something that I noticed, uh, being in, you know, professional conferences and things, uh, going through my functional medicine certification, certainly, but, uh, we see this in, uh, professional circles for people who do this type of work. And I call it the big shift or the big leap, um, where at some point, uh, you and I, and a lot of our colleagues, uh, made this decision or, uh, you know, our, or, or trained our bodies long enough to where we didn't have to, uh, 
you know, make a, make a mental decision every time somebody put a cookie in front of our, yeah. our, our face. And I see with my clients, uh, they haven't, many of them haven't made that shift yet. And you, you end up torturing yourself because, uh, you know, if you have to make a decision every time someone offers you a cookie or every time someone, every time you walk past an ice cream store, then, uh, you know, you're ultimately going to cave sometimes because you're going to have weak moments. You know, you're not going to be uh, mentally, you know, strong all the time. So if you can make that decision once and then uh, you don't have to make it every time somebody presents that to you, I think it's a much better way to go. That doesn't mean it's easy to do that. And and yes, you might slip back on that decision occasionally, but um, I like that mindset better. So instead of sort of saying, well, we'll see every time I'm going to a Christmas party. Well, maybe I'll have some cookies. We'll see. You know, it's no, make that decision ahead of time and decide what you're going to do. And then you don't have to torture yourself with that decision later. Um, I call certain foods no brainer foods. And I like this because most people uh, have at least one or two foods that they used to eat that they no longer eat, that they gave up for health reasons or whatever. Uh, Soda is a good example for a lot of people. So uh, many people at one point in their life drank soda. And, you know, most people I would think listening to this probably don't drink soda. And, you know, most people who, most of my new clients who come in have given that up long ago. And, you know, if they were at a party or at dinner and someone offered them a soda, they would just say, no, thank you. And it would have no emotional power over them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So that food has become sort of a no brainer food. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to make a decision about it. It's just an automatic response. And so what I try to encourage my clients to do is uh, choose some other foods that do have some power over them and try to shift them over to that no brainer column, you know, maybe one food at a time, especially if, if, you know, these are, are really powerful addictions and cravings. So, you know, maybe it is uh, bagels in the morning or something like that for somebody still, or it's the occasional cookie or whatever. And, and, uh, and if you really do want to eliminate that from your diet, uh, of course you can, and, and you're great at this doc, but uh, there's lots of ways to make these foods in, in healthier, you know, low carb ketogenic ways. But, but if you want to get rid of the sugar sweetened versions of these, shift them over to the no brainer uh, column and make that decision that, you know, you're just not going to ever have that anymore. And, you know, you don't have to, um, you know, maybe you mourn it for a day or whatever, but you don't, you don't have to, um, you know, make it a big deal. You just shift it over, find healthier versions of it or healthier options. And then every time it comes up, you just say, no, thank you. And, and eventually, you know, doing that over and over again, it'll lose its power over you. And, and then you can try that with other foods. So I found that strategy works pretty well as attacking sort of one food at a time, picking the ones that have the most power over you. Uh, and trying to shift those over to that no brainer food column, like you probably have with soda or some other things. Yeah, Brian, I love that strategy. And I'm also a big fan of just cause, you know, linking cause and effects. So when you see that no brainer food, like you're saying, think about whatever your pain point is, whether it's just not liking the way you look because you're overweight, it's not wanting to be on medications, it's having chronic pain in your body, it's having acne, it's eczema, you know, whatever it is, link that food to that pain point. And, you know, you're, you're going to be driven by either pursuit of pleasure, especially with food or a fear of pain. And so if you right. can link that pain, your pain point to that food, then that fear of pain saying, Hey, you know what? I really don't want to, um, experience worse, uh, worsening conditions. So that's going to override the desire to have pleasure from that food. Now, the good thing is, like you said, there are so many great recipes these days. I mean, if, if you tried to make this sort of dietary shift back in the 90s or even the early 2000s, it was hard to find all these alternative recipes online and products you could buy like on Amazon and all these different um, you know, Whole Foods and different retailers. But nowadays, there's so many things out there that um, are great replacements. You can literally almost find every single food, uh, you know, every single 
uh, recipe that you've always loved, you could find a sugar-free alternative that's using healthy ingredients and, uh, and start really putting those into, uh, into your regular rotation. That will, that will really help. And, you know, a big, big thing, obviously, we're talking about the ketogenic diet in this, in this summit, and ketosis is so huge for getting rid of sugar cravings because as your body starts to adapt to utilizing these ketones, um, you're, those cravings really go away. You really just don't notice the, the same hunger, the same craving effect. Your energy stays high. Your brain functions better. You have less inflammation in your body. You get all these extraordinary benefits. And I know a lot of people out there with diabetes, I may be listening to this, are thinking, but I thought ketones were bad for diabetes. I thought that that was like a disease condition. And so, Dr. Brian, can you um, can you talk about what ketoacidosis is, this disease condition versus nutritional ketosis? Yeah, that's great. And there are, there is some confusion there, uh, particularly with uh, mainstream conventional physicians. And as there's more and more data coming out about nutritional ketosis, I'm hoping this you know really starts to uh, fade a little bit. But but we still see it. And you know, as soon as I think we're kind of past it, you know, I have a client who you know their doctor scares them to death because they tell them that's the worst thing you can do. No, you know, don't do that. Right. But there is a huge difference, obviously. So um, nutritional ketosis, as most people watching this probably have learned is, you know, about uh, eating a diet uh, low enough in carbs so that you really burn fat uh, as your primary fuel source and you produce ketones uh, when you do that, when you break down fat. And those ketones can be a great alternative fuel source for the brain and uh, other body tissues. Now, uh, ketoacidosis is a disease condition that people with very high blood sugar uh, typically, we see this in, in type 1 or uncontrolled type 2 diabetes, can find themselves in. <clears throat> it's, there's a big difference. Uh, typically, uh, you're going to see very high ketone levels. People uh, who find themselves in ketoacidosis have two things. One is uh, high levels of ketosis. And uh, you're talking about very high levels of ketosis because typically they either don't make insulin at all or uh, they've become so insulin resistant that they just cannot control their blood sugar at all. They're not uh, utilizing glucose, so they're burning massive amounts of fat, and that's producing very, very high levels of ketones. But you're talking about you know, way out of the nutritional, you know, ketosis ranges. You're talking about really high levels of ketones. Yeah, it's like 20 millimoles. <clears throat> exactly, yeah, like 20 millimoles. Nutritional exactly. ketosis is like one to up to maybe five or six. It's really hard to exactly. on that. Yeah, so big, big difference there. Um, the other thing that happens is uh, actually the the uh, the ketosis part of it isn't really all that dangerous, but what happens is then the body gets very dehydrated, and all those ketones um, make the body acidic, especially with with the dehydration. So that's where the acidosis comes in, and that's the dangerous part is when the body becomes overly acidic. And then the organs actually can start shutting down. So when people uh, go through uh, ketoacidosis, uh, they they start feeling really really bad, uh, very lethargic, and this is like way past you know any uh, mild symptoms that you might have going through uh, the early stages of nutritional ketosis. Um, then they usually start throwing up, and uh, you know they be they they. Uh, go downhill very quickly. Um, they need to be hydrated, um, and usually that that's you know through IV because wow. um, it's they they can't even keep water down at that point. So it's a it's a very it is a very serious condition. Um, it's it's rare in people um, who uh, have controlled blood sugars, you know. So we don't see it as much anymore, and it's usually in people who, you know, we'll see their blood sugars are like in the four or five hundred range. You know, they're super high blood sugar, and usually they don't make insulin, or they're so insulin resistant um, that, uh, again, number one, their blood sugar is very high, and number two, they're they're basically just not able to use whatever insulin they have on board. So, it's a it's a rare condition. 
Um, we're not seeing it much anymore. Totally different. If you have sort of um, mild elevated blood sugar, like you're in a pre-diabetic range or even, you know, a blood sugar less than 150 fasting, you're not going to go into ketoacidosis unless, I mean, the, the only, I've seen one case uh, where somebody went into ketoacidosis with, you know, uh, without super high blood sugars, but they were already uh, sick. They were dealing with an illness. They were already really dehydrated. And, um, and basically, they're, they lost control of their blood sugar very quickly. But that's not the population probably that's listening to this. And even if you have diabetes, uh, if you're controlling your blood sugar, there's no risk of going into ketoacidosis. And you can use nutritional ketosis as a great strategy to improve insulin sensitivity and improve your blood sugar. Yeah, and from what I understand... Ketoacidosis only occurs when that individual is not able to produce any insulin. And right. they have really high blood sugar because they can't have insulin takes the sugar out of the bloodstream. And then they're producing ketones because ketones are produced when insulin goes low. So they have right. a combination of real high blood sugar and ketones. And we also know that insulin is necessary to retain sodium. And so right. exactly. that's why they get dehydrated because now they're excreting all the sodium. They can't maintain any water in their systems. They get really, really dehydrated. So the main issue is they're just not able to produce insulin. Whereas, you know, just about everybody that's listening is able to produce some, or if they're not, they're probably on some sort of a, uh, you know, insulin pump right. or insulin uh, inducing medication of some type that, uh, that gets some insulin in their system. So it's really like, totally uncontrolled, almost neglecting. Uh, exactly. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, I see a lot of uh, diabetic patients also that are on cholesterol medications because we know when you're insulin resistant, um, high insulin is going to basically cause your body to produce a lot more cholesterol. And so they go into their conventional doctor, cholesterol is high. They're going to be put on typical cholesterol lowering medication, statin. And so how do statins affect our blood sugar and our mitochondrial health? Well, there, there's a strong correlation. And so oftentimes we see people who have blood sugar issues are insulin resistant and they're not burning fat very effectively. So we see triglycerides go up and those elevated free fatty acids in the blood uh, drive those uh, production of uh, v, VLDL and LDL cholesterol particles, which... Uh, end up driving cholesterol up and and unfortunately the bad cholesterol you know the it's usually the small yeah. dense particles and uh the ones that have been associated with atherosclerosis and, and cardiovascular disease so that usually comes from again an inability to burn fat effectively which comes from high insulin levels and insulin resistance in somebody with diabetes or blood sugar problems um, as you mentioned uh it's standard therapy now to uh, recommend a statin medication for anyone with diagnosed diabetes, whether they have cholesterol problems or not, which to me is, is uh, almost crazy because um, statins have been associated with causing hyperglycemia and diabetes. Not only that, uh, statins can deplete uh, coenzyme Q10 and vitamin B12 and other important uh, nutrients that are important for nerve health. Yeah. And cholesterol is important for nerve health. You know, the nerves are sheathed in what's called a myelin sheath, which is made up of uh, fat, you know, and, and that fat is really important to protect the nerve. So when we see uh, cholesterol being lowered too much, which is the case in a lot of the clients that I see, uh, male clients will see it'll really affect their testosterone levels, which can then again have a negative impact on blood sugar. Yeah. Uh, we see it affects a memory and cognitive and cognitive function if they're dropping their cholesterol too much because the brain, of course, is also made up of fat. And it affects nerve health. You know, so we see an increase in things like peripheral neuropathy, which is that numbness, pain, and tingling uh, that uh, many diabetics suffer with. But we see that uh, increased in people who are using statin drugs. So uh, statins will affect all of those areas. Plus, as you mentioned, Doc, uh, the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is where 
uh, fat and glucose get burned essentially for fuel or cellular energy. And we need uh, cofactors to make those um, conversions happen. One of them is coenzyme Q10. So uh, a statin drug is basically a, uh, um, it blocks the production uh, blocks an enzyme, which is important for the production of cholesterol in the liver, but that same pathway is also uh, essential to produce coenzyme Q10, and we need that CoQ10 to, uh, for our mitochondria to function properly. So uh, uh, not to mention cellular health. So the cell membranes are also composed of, of a, what's called a, a lipid bilayer of fat. So uh, when we interfere with the body's production of what I consider to be an essential nutrient, cholesterol, it's going to have a whole cascade of neg negative effects, and we see that in clinical practice. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we're talking about mitochondria and so cholesterol lowering medications. They basically poison the mitochondria, and that's where, right. like, you can your body can burn glucose without the mitochondria. Right. But you can't utilize ketones without the mitochondria. Ketones, they go right into the mitochondria, are used up for energy, and you know, produce a, a rampant amount of cellular energy through the mitochondria. So if you're poisoning your mitochondria, you're really not going to be able to be keto adapted. And so it's going to you know, lead to furthering blood sugar issues and dependency on you know, carbs and sugar and stuff like that. And so you know, I just see so many problems with those types of medications. And you know, in general, um, I would say, you know, just as a clinician that very few, if any people really need to be on cholesterol or medication. What are your thoughts on that? No, I agree. I think, um, you know, there, there might be a, a case for people who have had, you know, a heart attack already or cardio cardiovascular event and they're, uh, you know, still sort of, uh, maybe older middle ages, you know, 40 to 60, um, there are there is some evidence there. Of, of course, I think lifestyle can do a better job, but yeah. uh, you know, statins uh, are somewhat anti-inflammatory and can um, you know can certainly lower LDL and total cholesterol. How much that really impacts longevity and heart health and cardiovascular health? is very debatable. So I would say for, for uh, almost everyone, uh, there's really no need for a statin. And I think uh, even for the people who, who seem to benefit from the research from statins, I think lifestyle changes can do a much better job. Yeah. And if people are going to be on statins, they should definitely make sure they're taking coenzyme Q10. You yeah, want to for support sure. NB12, like you were talking about, you want to really support uh, that mitochondrial cofactors. You want to make sure that you're supporting that. So I think that's super essential. And so what are what are some other supplements that you like to use? And we're talking about the ketogenic diet, you like using that with um, your diabetic patients. Mm -hmm. What are some supplements too that can help them to stabilize their blood sugar and help improve the their ability to get into ketosis? Yeah, well, I like carnitine too for fat yeah. burning. I think that's really important for a lot of people, especially if they have some mitochondrial issues. Um, a yeah. good, you know, B vitamin, broad spectrum B vitamins can be important. It provides a lot of those cofactors for um, for the citric acid cycle and and uh, all the things that happen there for for uh, energy production. Mm -hmm. um, I also like chromium uh, for most people. Um, you can test chromium levels through, you know, a intracellular chromium test, but I found that most people with blood sugar issues uh, are either borderline or low in chromium, cellular chromium. So I think uh, some chromium, uh, I like the polynicotinate uh, chromium. I think at least, you know, maybe uh, 400 micrograms of that a day is, is a good idea for, for most people with blood sugar metabolism issues. Um, I love alpha lipoic acid or R lipoic acid. I think those are uh, really important um, nutrients to protect nerve uh, cells in particular and uh, liver, cell, liver cells and kidney cells and uh, cardiovascular, uh, the endothelium of the cardiovascular system. I think uh, that's a really important nutrient. I love uh, curcumin, um, turmeric, uh, or, or, uh, or actually taking curcumin, curcuminoids. I think that uh, reducing inflammation naturally with uh, a spice like that that's been used for thousands of years 
uh, is, is really important. I love to do that golden milk with some coconut oil and, uh, and or, or coconut milk, and sometimes I use coconut oil or ghee, and then uh, ginger, black pepper, and, and, and curcumin or turmeric. Uh, that's sort of like uh, one of my go-to health cocktails uh, to reduce inflammation. I try to do you know a couple of that almost every night. And uh, so I think those are important. I love to try to get things in through food as much as possible, um, fiber in, in particular, and some of these other spices. Uh, cayenne pepper can be really good for uh, inflammation and, and blood sugar health. But, you know, sometimes we do, we do need to uh, supplement with nutrients. Uh, that's chromium, I think is a big one. Alpha lipoic acid, as I mentioned, wow. and carnitine. And then, um, um, the B vitamins, as I mentioned as well. So, uh, there's a lot more, but I, I think that's probably, you know, a good start. The other, the last thing I'll mention, uh, last two things are oils and uh, so omega-3 support is really important for, oh, yeah. for uh, cellular health and for in inflammation. Most people still consume uh, way too many omega-6 fats and not enough omega-3. It's just not very prevalent in the Western diet. So, you know, we have to kind of go out of our way to get more omega-3. And uh, the best source is, is going to be, you know, those cold water uh, fish and uh, fatty fish. And uh, unfortunately, there's concerns with mercury toxicity and other chemicals. So uh, obviously, we try to do wild caught fish as much as possible. But, you know, I think that's one that probably should be supplemented so we can get adequate doses of omega-3. And then those uh, short or medium chain triglycerides uh, for fast burning fuel like MCT oil, um, or, uh, even coconut oil is great for the brain. Uh, great to shift the body into fat burning key, ketone production. Yeah, totally. And so, you know, last question I'm going to ask you is what are your top five foods that people can use to help stabilize their blood sugar and promote this, uh, this development of ketogenesis and using ketones as fuel. And now you mentioned, cold water fish. So I'll count that. You mentioned coconut, kind of getting those MCTs. So what are yep. three other great foods? Um, this one is controversial, but uh, I still love uh, eggs. You know, I think yeah. eggs are a great protein source. Uh, the egg yolks are just loaded with, again, those B vitamins, choline, uh, lecithin, and mm -hmm. other important nutrients that uh, really help uh, you know, there's some in the vegan camp that would say eggs are the worst thing in the world for somebody with diabetes, but I have just not found that to be true at all. I think eggs are, are highly beneficial. Um, any type of fibrous, you know, above ground uh, vegetable is really the go-to food for, for somebody with blood sugar, I think, blood sugar problems. Um, I think... Um, you know, when you look at, for example, uh, the benefits of a vegan diet and uh, people reversing things like heart disease and di uh, diabetes with a, a vegan diet, all the benefits really come from the vegetables, you know, that they're eating a lot of vegetables. And so you can do that without being a vegan. You can do that on a ketogenic diet. You can do that on a uh, on a low carb diet, paleo diet, you can eat a lot of vegetables. I think we need to do that. The difference is uh, we recommend adding a lot of fat to those also, um, things like coconut oil and MCT oils to um, actually uh, you know, help uh, keep you full and, and drive the metabolism and, and help you uh, shift into fat burning mode. So, so I think green vegetables and that you know, could be uh, greens, uh, as well as things like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, you know, cabbage, um, even things like squash and zucchini, salad greens, you name it. Any of those above ground uh, fibrous uh, vegetables are really good. Um, and then uh, let me think one more it's here. Last one. <laughs> make, it, make it count. You get, you've already chosen some great ones. So. Well, you know, I think we, I mentioned it before, but um, I, I like peppers. I like uh, cayenne pepper, um, especially for people with uh, circulatory issues and inflammatory issues. I think uh, we, we want to try to encourage people to do more of that. It's, it's also a vegetable. So I'll try to think of one more as we're talking, but I think people don't eat enough of those and, um, and they can be really beneficial for sort of cooling that internal fire a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, they are real powerful anti-inflammatories. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, good. So I was going to add in, how about avocados? 
can't go. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Good. Well, yeah, any source of good fats, yeah, you know, exactly. olives yeah, and good. avocados. That is a good one. I should have said yeah, avocados. Absolutely. That's one of my absolutely. favorites. I love avocados. Oh, yeah. I love. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll mash up um, avocados with like a little bit of a, a green banana um, yeah. for the kids, you know, and, and uh, put a little bit of like some chia seeds, which is another good oh. one uh, on top of that. And it's, it's a great snack. And I find myself eating a lot of it too. <laughs> so yeah, really absolutely. You. you know, I probably eat two avocados a day because they're just so versatile. I put them in when I make a, uh, I make protein pudding. So instead of a protein shake, I typically do a pudding where I've got coconut milk in there and I throw avocado in and it just makes it really thick along with some healthy protein. Oh yeah, perfect. Add in. And then my family, we do guacamole like all the time. So we'll do, oh, yeah. you know, eggs with guacamole. We'll do, you know, meat dishes with guacamole. If we're doing vegan, we've got guacamole. It's like uh, just a staple right there. You can chop them up, put them on salads. I and mean, there's just so many things you can do. And nowadays there's avocado oil, right? And just get, get avocados in regularly. I think that's a, that's a huge... Huge. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I love to do like the chopped, you know, Julian vegetables in uh, in some yeah. avocado or some yeah. uh, guacamole, and oh yeah, uh, you know, that's a quick tip for people who who love guac and and uh, want to go to like their favorite Mexican restaurant is that we always ask for the, uh, you know, the fajita vegetables like uncooked yeah. on the side. They'll give you a big plate of those with the guacamole and skip the chips. It's really good. Uh, exactly. Yeah, really like good my, way to my do family, that. we go to Chipotle which uh-huh. has free range, uh, chicken. So they have healthier, healthier items, healthier meat products. And we just get double vegetables, right? Chicken, and then double guac. <laughs> nice. so that way it's <laughs> low it. carb. Yeah. We don't want too much protein. So we don't want to do like double chicken. So one, one serving of chicken should be totally fine, but then double guac. So we get the extra fats. So we're satiated For afterwards. Sure. And sometimes we bring our own coconut flour wraps. Have you ever seen those? I have. Yeah. Oh, those are great. awesome. Yeah. And so you can, and then we'll oftentimes we'll just portion it on the coconut flour wrap and nice. And uh, we eat it just like that. It's so good. It's keto. It tastes amazing. So, you know, it's another, another good Perfect. strategy. I yeah, love it. Absolutely. <laughs> so really good stuff. Brian, this has been an amazing interview and I really appreciate you bringing your expertise on diabetes and really some practical strategies people can apply to, uh, to start to, to follow this ketogenic approach and really giving people hope that you know diabetes is not a li- it's not a life sentence I mean you see in your clinic all the time when people start following these lifestyle strategies they adopt it they're able to get off of medications in many cases and um, you know for many of them you know in a sense they've reversed uh, the diabetes and and they're you know if you were to look at their fasting blood glucose and all the different measurements hemoglobin a1c that they were originally diagnosed with the diabetes to begin with, you would find that they don't have that condition anymore. And so there's definitely hope. And so I just want to thank you for coming on and, and sharing your expertise in that. And uh, do you have any words of wisdom or any, uh, any words of hope and empowerment for the people that are listening here as we, uh, as we finish this interview? Well, I think it would, it would just be that, almost exactly what you said, that there is hope that even if you've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you can still turn it around. And people aren't hearing that from their conventional doctors, unfortunately. You know, they're hearing that uh, there, there is no cure, you know, which uh, I don't really like that term, but the idea is that diabetes can be turned around and reversed and you can get control of your blood sugars again. Uh, I do this thing called the eight week blood sugar boot camp, and uh, you've been a guest interview on there uh, as well. And we just actually wrapped up uh, one of the programs, and it's my favorite week because. Uh, it's like a love fest at the end. We do like a wrap up call and I get like a dozen or more people, uh, sometimes, you know, waiting in line to come share the results that they're getting. And it's amazing. It, it like literally I'm high off of it for weeks because, uh, people talk about, you know, how, uh, they've been struggling for years and nothing's worked and they're able to bring their blood sugar back down to near normal. People have lost, you know, in eight weeks, 20, 30 pounds. And, uh, you know, they're, they've broken through cravings. They don't crave sugar anymore. And, you know, we teach the same principles that you're teaching here on the summit. You know, it's, uh, it's a good low-carb ketogenic style diet, getting the body to burn fat, lowering insulin levels, uh, becoming more insulin sensitive, and then getting the lifestyle under control, sleeping well, 
uh, you know, handling stress, fixing some of those other issues like gut problems and hormone balance, putting all that together. And the body is an amazing healing uh, being and has this incredible potential for health and healing. And if, if you do the right things, the body's naturally going to move back towards health. And that's, uh, that's, the, that's really the miracle. Yeah, I love it, Dr. Brian. Thank you for giving us that message. And how do people connect with you and learn more about you and the things that you're doing? Yeah, they can just go to drmole.com. That's D-R-M-O-W-L-L.com. And that's, of course, that's my website. That's my hub. Uh, you can find out about the different programs we do, check out our blog, uh, get on the mailing list for things that we send out. So just go to drmole.com. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again for being on, Dr. Mole. And if you, the listener, have gotten value out of this interview and really want to dive deeper in this idea of the ketogenic lifestyle, then I want to encourage you to consider owning the entire Keto Edge Summit for yourself. That way you get all the interviews, lifetime access, can listen to them at any time, the transcripts, all the bonuses that we have, really just a plethora of information and, um, and, and inspiration to help you navigate this journey. And uh, if you do that, we would be super honored and uh, we would just be blessed if, uh, if you chose to own this for yourself. So we will see you on a future interview. God bless everybody. 